Uh, welcome to our panel discussion. Nice to see you. Some new faces in the audience again. That's always nice to welcome uh, some, uh, yeah, some fresh faces. Not that we uh, don't want everybody else sit <laughs> sitting here. If you've been sitting here for, for longer in a while, it uh, shows us, okay, this must be a nice place to be. This is the place to be now if you're interested in the future of automation. And this is a very big topic because under the roof of Future of Automation, we summarize a number of research activities that uh, we link to technologies like AR, AI, edge computing with our core business, which is automation. Now, Siemens developers envision self-organizing production facilities that respond to autonomously changing production requirements and basically optimize themselves. Now, this means that in the future, Robots will no longer have to be expensively programmed to a time in, in a time-consuming matter um, with pages of code um, to provide them with a fixed procedure for, for, for assembling parts. We will basically only have to specify a task, and the system will then automatically translate these specifications to a, a program. Now, benefits include mechanical preci precision and uh, consistency, greater safety, of course, and decreased operating expenses. And this is a quote also from Siemens saying, there are many other researchers who are trying to solve this problem, but there is nothing comparable to what we have developed on the market yet. So let's talk to our experts in the field and let's give them a big round of applause when they come on stage. Here is the CEO of the business unit factory automation Siemens, Ralf Michael Franke. CEO of BrainCube, Zilvan Ruba, and co-founder and managing director, IoT World, Lucian Fogaros. Nice to have you. Welcome. Nice to have you here. Welcome. Nice. Welcome. Have a seat. So, wow, future of automation sounds uh, very, very interesting and uh, is is a major issue. Um, now, Michel, um, Ralf, Michel. 60 years, Simatic, a long history of automation technology. Yeah. History on the one side. What does the future look like? Yeah, I, I would say one thing is for sure, it looks different. OK. <laughs> so, and you see a lot here on booths. Uh, automation will be a lot influenced by technology we have used in our private life over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So we all know the iPhone is just 10 years old and influenced our personal life like hell. And this will also happen in the industry right now and will influence the architecture of modern automation in the future. So we will see edge computing, we will see artificial intelligence. We have almost everything mentioned already. <laughs> so nothing left for us here. Uh, and, and certainly it will change the complete way of solving tasks in the automation with hardware, mm -hmm. software, and also changing completely the way of engineer all the devices. And a lot of the stuff we can see here um, yep. at, at the booth already. Um, Lucian, um, you are from uh, the company IAOT World. What exactly do you do? So we are a digital publication focused on industry 4.0 topics, going from smart manufacturing to AI to uh, uh, predictive maintenance and so on, but we changed the model a little bit, engaging with subject matter experts such as my esteemed panelists here to share their vision, share their case studies, what are they doing so we can may inspire somebody, let's say, in uh, Detroit, Michigan, but also in Shanghai. So um, you can probably tell us something about AR, augmented reality, which is a fairly new technology. Um, how do you think um, AR can create value for industrial companies in the future? Sure. So there are, there are multiple ways that it could help uh, companies. Certainly, we are early on. However, uh, for instance, uh, multiple industrial companies uh, uh, were uh, working with uh, always had a subject matter expert close to the particular customer. So let's say if you're an automotive company, you had a distributor close by so they can jump in and help solve a problem. Uh, it's no longer that important to be close to the customer because a click of a button could get the best resource online to help you that. So you get the expert uh, on the line to help uh, paint that picture. So maybe we can uh, pass the next question on to uh, Zilvan. Is that cor pronounced correctly? Zilvan? Sylvain, yeah. Sylvain. Nice. I, I say Sylvain. Um, you're the CEO of BrainCube. What does BrainCube do? 
Uh, BrainCube is a French company that exists for 10 years uh, and that implemented the concept of Industry 4.0 for, for 10 years already. Uh, basically what we do, we are collecting all the industrial data from uh, uh, process industries and manufacturing plants. Uh, with this data, we are uh, building uh, digital twins of the produced products. That is, we have database in which you can know how each product was produced from the really beginning of your process until the really end of the process. And with this data, uh, we are providing a high algorithm that makes it possible to increase the productivity of your process. Um, by finding for by improving for instance the production standards defining new recipes that ma that makes it possible to produce uh, more products with less energy or less crap and so on and there's a lot of potential in that field if we talk about data processing for example um, now the whole world is talking about IOT the internet of things um, and that concern what are the requirements to make it affordable on the one side valuable and of course efficient for industrial companies yeah I, th I think there are three three main things in fact um, First of all, uh, you need to have use cases. You need to organize your use cases. There can be tons of use cases, and uh, right now we've, there are tons of opportunities. So you need to classify the opportunities, uh, to organize them, taking into account the ROE you can, you can get, and uh, to adopt a step-by-step -step, uh, organization in order to, to digitalize your, your, your organization. Second thing, you need to to organize the architecture of your data. Um, because basically, you, in most cases, you need to pass from a legacy environment where you can have several kinds of technologies. The more unified you are, the easier it will be, but you are not necessarily using uh, unified technologies. So you need to create a kind of layer uh, that organizes the data so that for the usage for the next step, which is the usage, you can go fast. Mm -hmm. um, of course, Siemens can provide solutions like MindSphere to, to organize that, because you, you put all your data in a layer, and then you can move forward, because you don't care anymore to where is the data on the field and where it's organized, uh, uh, and all this. Then I think the third thing, uh, which is key, is to uh, rely on uh, good partners, which are able to deliver um, apps that are ready to go um, mm. so that you are not obliged to program to make software development to, to create ad hoc things. So the more you can have uh, apps which are ready for the end user, fast to deploy, and the more you can be successful. So really, um, I think you need to have a strategy in terms of use cases, architecture, and also good and agile tools to go fast but okay. nevertheless step by step. Um, uh, Ralf Michael, you mentioned edge computing before. Yeah. Now, how do you rate the entry of edge applications in industrial environments? Yeah, uh, we spoke about uh, algorithms which help us to improve productivity or to decrease uh, energy consumption or to optimize quality. And typically, these uh, algorithms are very complex, mm -hmm. and with artificial intelligence, they have to be trained. Mm -hmm. Normally, these algorithms cannot be trained on a device, because the calculation power you need for that is much bigger. And here, helps uh, cloud comes into play to train the algorithm into the cloud, where you have a lot of calculation power available to really make them smart. And once you're ready with the training and uh, think that that algorithm could help you in your factory, then you download it into the Edge device and on site you really make the feedback, analyzing the data coming out of the factory, making the data from big to smart, and then close the loop and improve whatever is necessary in the automation of the factory itself to mm. then get more out of it. So and this, this, this cooperation, this collaboration is completely different from what we have seen today in the automation where we once engineer something and then it runs. 
relatively unchanged. Right. Never changed the running for years system and years for years and years. 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 With, with also some improvement opportunities, but not as fast and as efficient as with cloud computing and edge computing you are able to do. And I think a, a nice example of that come to my mind now. We had uh, um, uh, Dr. Beatrix Nata on stage here yesterday yeah. um, talking about senseformers. And, and that was a nice example of, of how transformers exist for over 100 years, basically. But now just recently um, are going through this change also uh, yeah. thanks to, of course, these technologies. Um, Zivan, um, AI, as, as Michael, Michael uh, Frank just, Ralf Michael, I'm sorry, just Ralf, mentioned. Just say, Ralf, Ralf it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> as Ralf just mentioned, um, will change the automation process. Um, and uh, how will AI basically change the operation and the diagnosis of the entire machinery? Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, AI uh, creates the opportunity to replace cognitive activities and to automate cognitive activities so that these activities are made by a machine. Uh, this is really new because uh, usually cognitive uh, activities were always done by, by human people. Uh, doing so, um, the activities that you can do from time to time can be done continuously. So it means that the monitoring uh, of a machine uh, that you, you are doing only in certain circumstances because you are in crisis mode or because it's not, the things are not going well or because you have organized yourself to do it once a week, once a day, is something you can now do continuously. The machine is doing it for, for you. So you are not missing any opportunity of detecting something, detecting an opportunity of improvement or detecting the needs for, for maintenance or for an intervention. Um, second thing, um, the artificial intelligence has got the ability to handle much more data than uh, uh, human behavior ca can do, of course. Um, so that, again, you are not going to miss something. Because where the human can focus only on the most important things, on the things that are already known from the past, the AI has got the ability to find uh, information in the mass, or in all the information produced by the, by, by the automation. So this is uh, uh, really changing the way we can operate uh, a plant, uh, because then the human can really focus on uh, uh, adding value, treating these alerts, and so on, instead of trying to understand what's going on and uh, mm -hmm. uh, losing time to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. They know what's going on, so then they can, they can act. J just to give some uh, um, um, common examples, uh, we are presenting on, on Siemens Booth uh, a case where the uh, IA um, determines what is the best product to put in production to increase uh, your productivity. Uh, also, uh, common cases are about uh, uh, predictive maintenance, mm -hmm. uh, where the, the IA alerts you about uh, uh, a defect that is going to, uh, uh, to, to happen on your machines and prevent you from breakage and production stops and so on. Right. And uh, also, one uh, uh, common topic we are dealing with is um, process optimization and machine that adapts automatically to the variability of your environment. The raw material is varying, the environment is varying, your tools are varying, everything is varying. And nowadays, operators need to correct a little bit, uh, just as when you drive your car, you need mm -hmm. to correct a little bit the tra trajectory. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, all this can be uh, uh, automated thanks to IA that adapts automatically to the uh, change in the conditions, um, creating uh, autonomous process, autonomous plants, as we will have uh, autonomous cars in a near future, I think. What, what is your opinion on this? If we think about AI uh, throughout the entire um, automation process, how do you think with your experience, how should, how should companies face, uh, face this well, process, this, this challenge? I, I think every company is in a different uh, stage in the automation journey, so they have to reevaluate the process. Maybe when they looked at automated quality control, maybe leverage of vision, maybe that was too expensive, but now perhaps with the machine learning in the process, you could teach the machine to, for instance, to check the quality. So maybe the cost of that is, is becomes, it's, it's coming down, so right. it becomes more affordable. Another example, 
that could be uh, looked at is uh, collaborative uh, robots, where we have some of the uh, machine ro programming robots in the past was extremely expensive, setting that up. Now, perhaps, if that learns, the robot learns from you just show it, it becomes much easier to right. be able to uh, program that. So it's basically looking at m more um, new business opportunities, right? Correct. Looking at it and, from that. Uh, and new business model uh, as well that also come into play that more and more companies are moving towards different business model from a large CapEx expenditure towards the OPEX as well. Monthly uh, credit card run type of expense. So, uh, Ralf, how is Siemens uh, facing um, this trend? I mean, what impact do these topics ha have on uh, the automation portfolio you have? Yeah. Um, you can already see a lot uh, changing here. So, uh, I just spoke with this gentleman here. Once you would have come here five years ago, you would not have found any of these applications very much driven by software and uh, you just would have seen products. Mm -hmm. And today it's a totally different situation because a lot of what is in former time being uh, performed with hardware products now is simply software. Right. So we have already adapted our portfolio in the past very, very heavily. And now the next wave, so to speak, will come where even the rest of what we have as hardware maybe disappearing somehow in other structures. So if you have 5G as a communication, for what do you need IOS? Right. And if you have this uh, virtual reality, for what you need HMI? And all this will definitely very, very much influence the way how hardware will be used or be necessary in the architectures of tomorrow. But what is still necessary in the end of the day is the functionality which is now hidden, so to speak, in the hardware. It's already today software, and we have to decompose mm -hmm. the complete piece uh, in a way that the customer gets value. So today, typically, the automation part of uh, factories sold uh, via CapEx, so the customer is buying it once, once he's starting to build the factory, and uh, then it's done. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the future it's different. So it's not that uh, the customer has to buy it once, but just take software, even runtime software, as a service on a monthly fee or based on how much product uh, we make the customer able to produce on the factories. And I think there's a lot, a lot possible and a lot necessary in the future. And it's not just related to the portfolio we sell, right. it's also according to the business models we are playing in the future in regard of automation. And there are also some great examples up out there of how this uh, has already been implemented um, to a certain degree. I was just talking to some uh, of the colleagues from, from Dulux uh, yeah. yesterday who were also on stage. Dulux, uh, Australia's largest paint manufacturer, who yeah. just recently opened up the first digital paint plant. Yeah. Also thanks to, of course, uh, digitalization and, and through this became basically a digital enterprise, and they were able to reduce their batch size from 5,000 liters to 100 liters. And this, yeah. is, uh, this is already possible today. Um, what about batch size one? That's uh, something I, I wrote down already. So there's no limit uh, in regard of reducing the batches to, to, to whatever you like. So the flexibility of these, uh, of these factories are incredible. And the beauty of all that is that everything what you're doing in a digital factory is then storage somewhere. And in the case of the, of the paint uh, uh, digital factory, for example, if a customer comes back after 15 years and mm. wants exactly the same paint in mm. maybe a liter to mm. make some repair, it's easily to be done in such right. kind of a factory. Right. And it's also reliability. This is also something which is uh, creating customer customer satisfaction. That's just one example. I mean, if we think about other things nowadays, uh, smartphones, tablets, all these devices come to market almost every month. And yeah. usually you'd have to uh, roll out an, an entire new production line for every product, yeah. um, which you can also basically uh, say in the future, well, I don't need to do that. Um, it basically will optimize itself, change uh, to, to new conditions. Exactly. I guess that's what we're looking yeah. at, right? Exactly. So um, one other thing I'd like to tap into, I don't know, it might be a, 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 a critical but fair question. Um, if we look at um, automation in the future, we're also talking about a radical change when it comes to jobs. 
not only blue collar jobs, white collar jobs are affected as well. Um, right at the production line, in the offices. What is your thought on that? I would say it's, it's nothing new. Look at my factory in Amberg. Um, it is uh, over 25 years old. Mm -hmm. It is 10,000 square meters big, and we have 1,200 people working there right. since these over 25 years. And what is different? Different is the qualification of the people working there, so they have to be trained, continuously trained to the new um, requirements we have coming out of the actualization of the products or the, the processes. And um, the throughput is somehow different. So the factory produces ninefold more mm -hmm. than it did in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So that means as long as you have growth and you can compensate the productivity you get out of uh, the factories in simply doing more, then with the training of the people, nothing dramatically will change because it anyway did not take time overnight. It takes a while. So, and what, from my perspective, will be different in the future with the future of automation? In the past, it only affects the blue colors. Right. In the future, it will affect the white colors as well, the engineers. So okay. they are going into the same process. It has a positive side that they can concentrate on, on the creative part of the work, which is anyhow much more fun. And on the other hand side, they also have to continue to train and learn to be updated and able to apply the new technologies of the future. So it's basically a question of education, I guess yeah. you're, you're aiming for here. Not really a question of the technology itself. It will evolve. This is taking place already. It's not like anything can be stopped in this manner. But uh, what would you say uh, from France or from, from, from the States, um, if we talk about the education uh, part here? I guess this is, this is the main problem then, right? I yeah, clear, clearly the education is, uh, is, is the key because the jobs uh, will change uh, with probably more interesting jobs, right. uh, more creative jobs, as you say. This is also creating a great opportunity, and uh, especially for France, we are much concerned about that, uh, of relocalization of jobs uh, producing uh, in Western countries and in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, where... Uh, in the last years, uh, many jobs went to uh, uh, low-cost countries. So there are also opportunities to relocalize and to create jobs here and interesting jobs. So, but of course, education needs to, to follow for sure. Lucien? I, I think we're already seeing case studies where uh, the automation and let's say the ro putting robots, it's keeping or, or, or keeping the, the the production close to the customer. I think as, I was just reading on the way here was a CBI Insights report, and they were fe uh, featuring Adidas, where they're placing a factory in uh, Kansas City. It's a Chinese factory mm -hmm. that's putting a, a, a Kansas City factory, uh, where everybody's at a, a almost double than the minimum wage, mm -hmm. but it's different. It's no longer the muscle. It's more important to, let's say, uh, uh, fix the robots and so on that's doing the work. So I think uh, we can conclude uh, this session. Um, or is there anything else uh, you'd like to add? Yeah, we can continue uh, <laughs> until tomorrow, if you like. So <laughs> there's so much to talk about uh, the future of automation, and we have so many ideas. Uh, and we desperately look for people turning the ideas into reality. And I think this is something which is, at least from my point of view, the challenge, that we have to follow the speed of change with enough people being able to do it. And there it helps that uh, some of the work which today has to be done manually, very boring, typing in something in the engineering, is done by robots and artificial intelligence in the future. It helps. It helps. We'll close it with that, ladies and gentlemen, and I'd like to give a big round of applause to our experts here on stage. Thank you very much. Lucian, Sylvain, and Ralf, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.